lot more people to join. Once they finish their break, I think after that plenary session, a lot of people took a tea coffee break and I think they'll now be heading towards uh, these boardroom dialogue rooms. So just come over, I think uh, just don't uh, hesitate. I think we won't ask questions. We'll give you a chance to ask, you will ask us questions, we won't ask you questions. You can come and sit in the front seat as well, okay? So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so we are here for the 11 o'clock boardroom dialogue session. And the topic that we are gonna talk about is about advancing Asian regional integration. And I have a very um, amazing and eminent set of panelists here. So I'll go through their profile one by one, but let me just set the context of what it means uh, when it comes to regional integration. So many of the region's nations are interconnecting their road, rail infrastructure, to boost prosperity within the Asian Economic Community Blueprint. Now the question is, will these changes overcome historical antipathies and distrust? Could a stringent-like movement of goods, capital and services and people follow? And what are the critical factors here? So we'll dwell upon this topic, we'll draw upon the perspective of various panelists, and we'll also look at what are the lessons and sort of, you know, uh, prognosis for Asia. Now I have with me on my um, very left, uh, let's start from uh, let's start from Phil. So Phil O'Reilly, he's the managing partner of Iron Duke Partners New Zealand, and I'm just gonna tell their name and the company right now and what country they represent. But I'll also give them a chance for two to three minutes to give a more uh, introduction about themselves, their company, um, you know, what's their connect with the the topic, and any opening remark they may want to offer. So just bear with me while I'll just read out the names. So on the very left, uh, extreme left from my side is Phil O'Reilly, his managing partner, Iron Duke Partners, New Zealand. Next to him is uh, Torkel Patterson. So correct me if I'm pronouncing the wrong name wrong. I'll be happy to correct. Uh, Torkel is member of the board, Central Japan Railway Company, Japan. Then to my very immediate left is uh, Mr. Su Ming Wong. He is the chief executive officer of Chemp Ventures Australia. Then to my immediate right is Mr. Stanley Lowe. Stanley is Chief Executive Officer of World Capacity Builders Canada. Next to uh, Stanley uh, on my right is uh, Yukiko Ito. She is the Founder and Chief Executive Officer of Jest Inc. Japan. And next to Yuki is Peter Porthien. Uh, Director, Eidenhoven International Project Office, the Netherlands. So with that, let me start from the very left, and I'll give them three minutes to just introduce and talk about the connect with the topic. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. I'm Phil O'Reilly from New Zealand. I should apologize for my overly casual dress. I arrived safely in Ho Chi Minh last night, but my luggage did not. So hopefully it'll, <laughs> hopefully it'll arrive sometime today. Um, I, I, I run a tiny little business in Wellington called Iron Duke Partners, uh, but you don't need to worry too much about that. The main reason I'm here is I chair business at OECD based in Paris, which is the formal business group that points at the OECD 37 member states. As a result of that, I'm senior in the work of the B20 this year, uh, in, of, course, of, of course hosted in Argentina, meeting of G20 leaders happening in a few days' time, and I've been engaged in the work of the B20 making recommendations to those leaders, as I have been for a number of years now. And the third thing I do, which is relevant to this meeting most of all, is I'm on the APEC Business Advisory Council, ABAC, representing uh, New Zealand, one of the three New Zealanders who's appointed by leaders. And just, in fact, a few days ago, I sat next, sat next to the, the Prime Minister of Vietnam in our small group session talking to him about regional economic integration, as a matter of fact. So I spent an awful lot of time around the world, both in Asia uh, and in Europe and the other older uh, uh, democracies of the world, uh, at the interface of government and diplomats and the interface of government and public policy makers. Uh, that's my job. Uh, really what I wanted to talk today about and introduce in terms of uh, regional integration is the really important role that's going to be played by APEC through this whole process. Uh, APEC is an important role because it's not a rules-based standard-setting body not like the WTO or, or even the OECD in that sense. It's a voluntary body made up of countries that want to be there. In fact, economies, it's not just countries, both Chinese Taipei and Hong Kong China are members of APEC, even though they're not formally 
recognised as countries by many people. Uh, so it's an important body, and, and, and the role of economic integration plays out very importantly there. Uh, we had just had some, some issues over the last week or so, didn't we, where because of some arguments between the US and China, APEC leaders could not agree a leader statement for the first time in 30 years at their meeting in Port Moresby, Papua New Guinea. But in behind that, the point that I'll seek to make is that the business community remains very, very committed to an, to an ambitious agenda for global economic integration, regional integration, sorry, in, in uh, the APEC member economies. Most importantly, that's going to play out over the next few years as we renegotiate and come up with the new BOGOR goals. You might have heard of these things. They're about 15 years old. They were agreed in BOGOR, Indonesia, as a way of really getting uh, uh, APEC to move towards a common vision. They're being renegotiated because they expire in 2020. New Zealand hosts APEC in 2021. The business community is saying, we want an ambitious future for APEC based on what we call FTAP. That's an acronym for Free Trade Area of the Asia Pacific. Not a free trade agreement, but a free trade area, incorporating a whole bunch of very important and, and we hope, uh, ambitious goals to make sure that we become more integrated, not less. The key take out of that process, and I'll finish on this point, is while governments might be arguing about whether or not they seek to be protectionist or not, the business view is very clear, very consistent, and very homogenous, even taking into account American, Chinese, and other business, business people. It is about moving towards a much more ambitious uh, regional economic agenda through the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. So next, uh, Mr. Patterson. Yeah. I'm Torkel Patterson, and I'm on the uh, board of Central Japan Railway. I'm also on the uh, vice chairman of the uh, International High Speed Rail Association, which promotes uh, high speed rail uh, around the world. Uh, I came to the transportation high speed rail area later, before I worked in the defense industry, but I switched to work on infrastructure because, one, it's high technology that I appreciate. Uh, w with uh, maglev, et cetera, but also because I believe that the 21st century is really going to be about and be known as uh, the, in the uh, uh, infrastructure and integration century uh, historically when we get through a lot of other things that we're dealing with now in the near term. So that's the reason that I've chosen to be involved with this. Uh, we are the operator of the world's uh, the most profitable railroad, and we're also supporting railroads in uh, new countries from the standpoint of transformation, not transportation. I don't know. Uh, so it's a transformational approach. Why should a country invest billions of dollars in transportation infrastructure when some countries already have it. And later, if we have a chance, I'd like to talk about hmm. the example of Singapore and Malaysia and why Singapore and Malaysia are choosing to invest billions of dollars in a high-speed rail when they already have uh, very good uh, transportation between Singapore and KL. Uh, so we can talk about, about that point of view. So thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Next, let's, uh, Mr. Wong. Yeah. Thank you. Good morning, all. Uh, uh, my job is a really full-time job as a private equity manager in Australia, and we are investing. We have invested over a portfolio of about 50 companies over the last 20 years. That most of them would have trading relationships in Asia. So I'll, I won't talk about the obvious advantage of advantages of integrating Australia with the rest of Asia Pacific here. I think you know, Phil is covering that. I'm going to be controversial and stick to the integration in terms of the physical route between Southeast Asia and Australia um, for two things that I don't want to touch on. One, Northern Australia is very underdeveloped and geographically Darwin is closer to Jakarta than Sydney and Partly because of the vastness of Australia, freight cost within Australia is very high. So it's cheaper to import things from Asia into Brisbane 
then to freight it from Melbourne to Brisbane. So there is some business opportunity to think about integrating physically between the northern part of Australia and Southeast Asia. Uh, agricultural groups has been tried before. High-speed ferry was po tra uh, considered as a potential connection between physically between Australia and Southeast Asia. So I'll leave that on the table. And the second thing to do with the physical integration of Australia is more to do with the strategic anger. Since the strategic competition with China and US has halted out, Darwin has become an army base to uh, permanent basis on US Marines. And the Australian government has spent a lot of money starting to ramp, now ramp up the northern waters of Australia for, for security reasons. And as a adjunct to that, now recently with the, with the APEC conference in Papua New Guinea, South Pacific has also become a contested geography in, 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 in terms of the US-China rivalry and Australia being part of the, you know, the Western democracy is trying to help to soften that competition by contributing to the develop infrastructure development in Papua New Guinea. So those are the two topics that I'd like to leave on the table. Perfect, perfect. So then let me move it up to Mr. Stanley Stanley. Good morning or good afternoon. My name is Stanley Lowe. Um, I'm CEO of a company called World Capacity Builders. Our aim is to raise the standards of living of the unbanked and the underserved mm. in the world. Uh, there are about four billion underserved people in the world and about two billion unbanked in the world. So we're trying to raise the standards from a $2 a day market to a $2.50 market. So the, the 50 cents is what I'm looking for. And we invest in technologies and infrastructure to help achieve that 50 cents balance. Right. Now on Asian integration, what I see is there is a coming together of minds of the leaders of the countries to work together. I see that quite clearly. Um, because we, our company deals with heads of state quite a bit, um, and we do FDIs in some countries. Um, what, would, what drives them together? Can you hear me, you hear me now? Oh, what, drives, what drives them together is connectivity. Um, we're trying to reach the rural parts of the country where the poor people can, can get the same access of people in urban countries. So we're investing in those kinds of uh, infrastructure. Um, and lucky thing is I think the development of technologies is meeting those standards. And I'm sure, Manish, you can tell us about in your entertainment business, mm -hmm. uh, you are reaching a lot of people yep. further yep. than a lot of other people. And we I are seeing tremendous there. growth. I mean, as access to technology is improving, I think a right. uh, lot more people have connectivity and access now, right. and they are far more aware. Yes. So we also have a very good relationships with uh, certain departments in China. We, we have a joint relationship with the CRTV, China Radio Television Corporation, where we can use the content in China and distribute outside, mm. and content outside curated and sent to China. Mm. So we're doing that too. Um, on the payment side of things, we work cl closely together with Union Pay. Mm. Union Pay is the largest card company in the world. They have 5.3 billion cards. Okay, that's a lot of cards. It's more than Visa, MasterCard, Amex put together. All right, and they, they are developing a mobile wallet where we could use to send money to a phone number. Mm. That's already, we, technically we can already do that. So it is now regulatory stuff that we want to get through. Thank you. Next, uh, let me ask Yuki to in, in introduce herself. 
Hi, I'm Yuki Ito from Japan, Tokyo. Um, I'm one of the first female programmers in Japan and have been um, developing software for 37 years. Um, and at that time, um, female, female were not even allowed to touch computers. So I always had to crack everything <laughs> to get through what I really wanted to do. Um, I fell in love in computer and uh, but there was no place that I can work, so I had to start my company. <laughs> and if you, even if you start a company, nobody wants to order to a female at that time. Yeah. So you have to be very different from everybody else. I had to focus only on the painkillers that will really, that, that is like unsolved problems that I have to tackle. And I've been doing that for the last 30 years, but I was working like an engineer. The last four years, I figured out that one of a program that I developed 15 years ago was needed all around the world. And that is um, automation for scheduling, um, especially this complex scheduling for technical people sending out to various places like field service workers. They have to go to various places, but it was not easy to schedule them because they all have different aspects and various different conditions. We automated that and automation is not the really, automation was helping the people, the schedule coordinator to become more like a human being, not like a robot anymore. So my um, ambition from very early stage I had a talent in computers. I really wanted to serve a lot of people with my talent so that everybody will be much more happier. The same thing is that there are many other talents out in the world that is not um, used to maximize max potentiality what they have. Um, and this automation of scheduling is also helping a lot of people. Um, these field service workers, we have doubled their efficiency. Um, they can work more than before and use their talent in maximum potentiality. Scheduling is not only for one company. You can sell like each to one company, but what we do is actually as a platform and we can take out the company's wall be between the company's wall. And what happens is that we can optimize the whole industry. And further on, it's not only the whole industry, but it's cross-border the industry. Currently, we're focusing on home health because it's a huge aging population growth all around the world, and there's not enough human resource. So that will help. If we double the efficiency, the human resource shortage will go away. But what I'm trying to do is not only one industry, but it, will, it can go over other industries, like people who are working outside of home care can work on that too. But why this topic today is interesting for me mm -hmm. is our platform is not only that, cross-border of industry or companies, it's actually cross-border of all the nation. So if you have good talent in one place, and another good talent in other places, but maybe they're not supposed to be working there. They can go everywhere in the world. That is where I want to go, which, which will help a lot of people all around the world. And I think the technology is already here today. I actually, I've been here for almost a week now in Vietnam. It, must, it was my first time in Vietnam. I don't know any word in Vietnamese. But what I did was using Google Translate with Grab and even in the hotel housekeeping, I can communicate yeah. whatever I want to. Yeah, that's how uh, I've been surviving as well. <laughs> <laughs> so technology is all here. Even for the software, what I'm doing, the scheduling, technology is here for cross-boarding. Everything is ready. I think the most important part is, it's, I think it's really education for younger people for children to learn that there are other countries ha value different kind of things, cultural things. And if you avoid that, if you uh, ignore these kind of cultural things, 
even if the software or hardware, or everything is ready, it's really, really difficult, especially in home care and home health. Elderly people like to be looked after by their own country, own people, because they understand how you, s you feel like. What is polite, what is nice to say, is different by country by country. So I really think that if we can start the education for little children to learn about other countries' history, mm. other countries' culture, and learn how to accept, mm. and also learn about yourself and try to express and exchange information, that is something I think is important in this, what we want to do. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Peter, yeah, next to you. All right, Mr. Chairman, distinguished panel guest. Um, I'm from the Netherlands, and as you well know, uh, a small country, but also part of the EU, uh, European Union, a single market where we have benefited a lot of in the last 20 years, but where you also see these first cracks and a big crack yesterday when the European uh, Commission uh, uh, actually agreed upon the Brexit. So there are some th uh, threats ahead, and I think you can make the analogy also to ASEAN if you question about the opportunities. But I'm uh, representing a private advisory for economic advisory and development, both in the Netherlands, and you also have an office here in Asia. And we had the privilege of uh, working with the Bekamex and the Binzun government over the last three years in the transformation of their economic strategy. So I've been close to these guys over the last few years, and we have a very fruitful and constructive way working ahead. And where, as you also hear the Prime Vice Prime Minister uh, mentioning during his opening statements, this is a province where a lot is going on, and they are going, uh, getting at to pace in the international global market. And I think that is also important to look at. Um, my equation on uh, regional integration is all about the international tension uh, due to the uh, trade uncertainties and also the opportunity for ASEAN to grab uh, part of the conversion of supply chains which are moving to, to ASEAN. And on the other hand, they also put a, a quite a challenge on these Asian countries because the individual countries are moving incrementally, step by step, but I think they have to leapfrog if you want to take a big chunk of this uh, opportunity. And as you're well aware, um, supply chain is not, no longer only about the seamless logistical connections, but it is also about how can you integrate knowledge in these supply chains, because supply chain integration is not only outsourcing your production, but it is also about how can you co -de design, co-develop products in the same supply chain with your partners. Um, and the third element is uh, then you would be needing a seamless digital integration as well. And I think that is a challenge where there should be focus on ASEAN level to have a digital agenda, how you can enable this type of supply chain conversion. That's, a, a, I think, a challenge for every country, but also a challenge how you can regulate that on the ASEAN level. And what we see today is that there are many e-commerce type of startups around Asia but they are mainly providing access to uh, Chinese and US-based large vendors like Alibaba and Amazon. And so they are not leveraging the, the growth of the local economies and the local producers here in Asia, but they are just giving access to Chinese manufacturers to take part of that consumption here in ASEAN countries. So in the digital strategy, I think there should also be a strategy of e-commerce where that platform should drive the growth of local producers, providing them access to the global market. Um, so maybe to start the discussion that is my uh, opening statement thank you thank you thank you everyone i think uh, i'm quite amazed by the diversity of background and also perspective here so let me get to the core topic and let's try to draw out some good uh, you know perspective uh, on specific topic so when you talk about regional integration there are a couple of aspects to it right one one would be around uh, the physical integration of you know infrastructure and rails and roadways the other is basically around economic integration. And as we think about uh, integration, that's about like movement of materials, people, and money, right? So let's start with uh, talking about physical integration. And I think uh, let's understand where things stand today and what would be uh, you know, an ideal state. So let me pass it on to Torkel. Torkel is the chairman of, uh, uh, vice chairman of International High Speed Rail Association. So let's talk about physical integration, and I think what do you, how do you describe it as the current state of physical integration among the Asian countries, and what would be your sort of uh, ideal situation and how to get there? Well, there's a lot going on. 
in the region. I think I'm on. Can you hear me? Yeah, there's a lot going on in the region. And uh, it uh, has to do with different types of rail. A lot of people talk about freight, of course. I think there's a big demand for freight around, uh, around India, around Southeast Asia. There's a big demand for in what I would say incremental high-speed rail where you start slow and move up in speed. And then there's uh, true high-speed rail or the 300 kilometer an hour high-speed rail that India is trying to do and Singapore and Malaysia is trying to do and that someday Australia will do between Sydney and Melbourne. And from our point of view, uh, if I could focus for a minute on the latter, on the high-speed rail end of it, uh, you need to look at viable city pairs. And those are city pairs that already have existing a lot of transportation around them, and then they're not too far apart. So 500 kilometers to 900 kilometers apart is a perfect distance. And then why, why would you uh, invest in that billions of dollars where, for example, Sydney and Melbourne are the in the top five uh, busiest air route in the world, and so is KL Singapore, and yet they're talking about high-speed rail. And the reason is because you can uh, do so much more and to move your cities together to make one economic unit. So in the case of Australia, for example, uh, the Australia, most of the Australian brand, what is brand of Australia? The brand of Australia has been, ag has been uh, minerals and resources. So they've been a resources power. But in the future, their brand is going to be services. And the Australian brand, right now, they're playing intramural football, soccer and Australian rules between Sydney and Melbourne. They're not really realizing that their potential is being to be unified as uh, one economic region. So if you look at the U.S., we have the Northeast Corridor. Japan, Inc. is basically between Tokyo and Osaka with Nagoya in the middle. In the future, it's going to be, uh, you know, the power of Australia is really going to be Sydney, Melbourne, and Canberra integrated into one unit. And you look uh, at the, why did the U.S. do NAFTA, you know, setting aside the criticism of mm -hmm. uh, President Trump against it. The real purpose, I was at the, worked at the NSC for Bush and Clinton and Bush during that period of time uh, on and off for all of them. And the vision of NAFTA uh, and the vision uh, going forward was that you have an economic disparity between North America at the border and that part of North America south of the border, mainly Mexico that in the future would become a major security problem if we didn't rationalize the economy, raise the level of Latin America, of Mexico, so that Mexico would not uh, in the future become a stampede into the United States, and it's worked. Uh, reverse immigration from the United States back to Mexico has been a positive trend now for the last se several years. So the immigration into the U.S. now that Trump is complaining about is coming from south of Mexico not from Mexico. So we, the economic dynamism of Mexico as a result of NAFTA has led to that. So if you move to the, looking at the situation between Malaysia and Singapore, why did the, why did the Singaporeans want to do a high-speed rail connecting them to the KL, and why does KL want it? The reason is because Singapore by itself and KL by itself is not big enough to be globally competitive. You need to have a bigger mass. You know, Mumbai and Ahmedabad why integrate them by high-speed rail? The reason you integrate them is because you don't just get two cities connected. You get the region between them connected uh, there. And so you have a really dynamic region because you don't compete by countries. We talk about competing by countries, but in services, you're competing by cities. You have New York, you have Sydney, you have Chicago, you, know, you have the LA area, you have the Bay Area. You know, you have Silicon Valley, all of, and all of what that implies or means. You have Microsoft you know, up in the Northeast. So we have five of them in the United States. But uh, in Europe, you have certain corridors that really mean something. So how do you get the volume and the scale to mean something? And that's, what, that's why Singapore and Malaysia are going to try to integrate their economies together using high-speed rail to do it. So you connect what now takes, uh, you know, it takes a, like barely an hour to fly, but because of the congestion, you really have to plan two hours. You'll have be 90 minutes by this high-speed train, but you'll be able to stop, not in the initial go-round, but in later versions, you'll be able to stop at cities in between and add them to that dynamic area. And by having frequent, fast, safe, reliable, so not one train an hour, 
you know, one train every 10 minutes. Tokyo has one train every four minutes at rush hour. Some of the lines in China also are under uh, so totally 10 you're talking about more like passenger travel. How about material and goods? Are you talking about that as well? Or is your it, well, comment I think is you more about... I think that that's a very good question. And I think as was mentioned yeah. by Mr. Wong and as, yeah. as India's core and as yeah. Vietnam hmm. really also thinks about this, you need the uh, freight yeah. infrastructure. Freight is really critical. Australia is the world's nominally the hmm. best, most advanced freight country in the world. Uh, and there's a lot that the world can learn from Australia. Uh, India is, is moving on the Mdum Delhi Mumbai mm. industrial corridor with mm. electrified freight going on it. Uh, da Nang connecting uh, Ho Chi Minh City to Da Nang and Hanoi to Hue and connecting the freight line is a precursor to moving people. You, know, you need to have the freight and the transportation of goods and develop those corridors from here. What will make the difference for this uh, uh, Vicomex idea, the vision of Vicomex is the transportation link uh, here and out. Can you move the freight in and out? So maybe yeah. a good time just... Yeah, Peter, go ahead. Well, just to catch up on that, um, there is a concept, um, it's called the Southern Key Economic Zone, and that's actually this uh, integration of uh, large cities in the south of Vietnam who all have their own assets, like Ho Chi Minh was in the international airport, seaport, Khao Map in the south, which was also a seaport, and Binzung obviously located in the inland and is also uh, uh, very depending on these seamless logistical connections. And there is a trend to move away from road cargo towards either railway or inland waterways because of also mm. of the CO2 uh, uh, footprint of these mm. different types of transportation. And obviously, Vekamex is a large investor to integrate these different uh, assets and they're building on that railway, they're building on the mm. metro between mm. Ho Chi Minh because that's the flow mm. of talent and these railways will be the flow of goods between these business parks if you have seen around here and the international connections either the sea or the, rail, the, the, the airport and as you are mm. aware in one of the neighboring provinces Dong Nai they are planning to build the, the next international airport for Vietnam so that is exactly and but it's still difficult on a national level to get all these agendas aligned to have these different provinces and cities on the same agenda and also yeah. on the I same think, goal of this integration. Yeah, and I think that's a great comment, Peter. So we talked about, I think, uh, Torkel was, uh, he talked about the importance of this and the benefit. Let's talk about what are the challenges are there in going there, because it seems like something that should be done, but it is not happening probably at the pace at which it should be done. So the challenges could be within the country challenges and, and also if you look at across countries, what are the typical challenges? Anyone wants to comment on it and sort of what could be done differently to do these things at a, at a much faster pace. Can I just start on that one, yeah. Chairman, by saying that I, I was just in China yeah. when I went yeah. to, from Xi'an to Kashka. Yeah. And I did, I did go to a town called Jiayuguan, which is really quite a remote town. Mm. And it has a population of 200,000. Mm. I got there by high-speed rail. Mm. Now, there's no other country that can justify having a high-speed rail to a town with 200,000 people. Hmm. So, Kotel might be able to answer that because Australia has been debating this high-speed rail hmm. for the last 30 years, and the economics just hasn't stacked up hmm. because of our population density hmm. hasn't warranted that. But in China, there is this mentality of that we'll build it, and then the people will yeah. come. So within the country, it seems like some countries do not care about economic returns in the immediate, and they just go ahead and do it because there's a top-down mandate. So that seems to work. Um, so that's one way to look at it. Between countries, also let's comment. And I think, uh, Phil, you wanted to go in. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to reflect on a, on a point that uh, Peter was making earlier on. That is that if you have a look at the, the different, uh, the different uh, regimes, the EU, was born out of the horror of two world wars yeah. and a determination never to go back. If you actually, if you actually put a map of New Zealand yeah. over Europe, the north of New Zealand starts at about Hamburg, the south of New Zealand finishes south of Gibraltar. So Europe's actually quite a small part of the world compared to many of the countries in, in ASEAN and in the wider Pacific. Yeah. I mean, Australia is a massively bigger country than that. So you've got the advantage of relatively small geographical scale in Europe, lots of wealth, not too many big physical challenging barriers, it's relatively flat compared to say Papua New Guinea, hmm. uh, and, uh, and this, this desire to become closer together. And therefore you get 
a much more politically aligned and a politically engaged mm. framework. You simply don't have that here. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of differences here. One big difference is in economic development, Singapore versus, say, Myanmar, just to give a simple example. Second, you've got lots of C in between everybody. Mm. And third, the, the kind of uh, integration that you're getting is energetic, no question about it. The ASEAN single economic community, all of that stuff's going on. Mm. The, the, the Bogle goal, uh, the Bogle goals, as I've just talked about through APEC, but the political process hmm. of getting you there is much harder because, the, because of those differences. And, and the, now you add to that the tension of one big neighbor to our north called China yeah. and another huge neighbor out to our east called the So US. could that and common you, big country cause other countries to unite and form an association? Would that actually help? Because when you have a one big country on one side, the other smaller countries have all the more incentives to come together and sort of form an economic or, you know, Integration. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think ASEAN is, is a really important key here. Yeah, so that it enables the smaller countries to play together without having to take sides. And I also think APEC is important because of its voluntary nature mm. and the very idea of building digital frameworks and digital connectedness, mm. the very kinds of issues that APEC is working on right now. Those kinds of forums are very important for that reason. Yeah. You want to make a comment? Yeah. Just uh, on uh, Mr. Wong's comment. Uh, the key ingredient in the successful areas is, is leadership and vision. And China had both of those. China had leadership and has vision. And India, under Prime Minister Modi, has leadership and vision. And removing corruption, which is also an agenda item for China, but is so important on these large infrastructure projects. Because what's the difference between success and failure of a big infrastructure project? There's lots of attempts. Mm. But it often hinges on leadership, but also corruption. Mm. And is the purpose of that project because you want to get something done, or is the purpose as an opportunity mm. to make money? And that's a leadership question. So under Najib, Malaysia had m infrastructure projects for the purpose of money. Mm. And when Mahathir came in, he canceled some of those. Yeah. So the the you know the opportunity because the money is big people think think oh this we let's build infrastructure because there's r lots of money to go around to everybody yeah. but mm. the real necessity i think is to have the commitment to the, your country and the future of your reason so the big i think the one of the big challenges in infrastructure is that the second one is financing, financing. and and australia is really leading uh, innovative approaches to financing which japan has done for some time but how do you get the value of the integration and how do you monetize that value ahead of construction to the to the extent that governments feel that they're going to get the boost in tax revenue that will allow them to move forward and in the case of rail infrastructure the rail should pay for itself if you build the infrastructure part by the government the operation of the rail should not have to be subsidized for uh, high-speed rail or freight or any of that and uh, but getting to that point where the balance the private sector which takes the operational risk and the public sector which takes the infrastructure risk i think if you can balance that mm. then they can be win-win for everyone no that's a, that's a great comment um let me switch the topic now from physical uh, in, uh, infrastructure integration to more like economic integration so clearly i mean we have example of eu where they came with the same currency and that's far more integration we also see some integration happening with ASEAN. Anyone wants to comment on sort of what's the what's their perspective on how this could be furthered, and what's the what's the areas of opportunity, economic integration between Asian region? Anyone wants to go? Um, wants to make a comment? Yeah. I I will have a go. I just think there's is a it's a second order issue hmm. to have um, frictionless currency. Yeah. movement. I think what happened in the EU, in a way, the macroeconomic condition with the central bank and the budget yeah. sort of leadership of Brussels with Rome, I, I good luck to them. So I, I think that is a, given the cultural diversity and historical mm. heritage that we have in Asia, that's quite diverse. I think that that is a real, much more bigger challenge than having a physical, yeah. physical integration. Yeah, I think yeah. having a common currency probably would be uh, not happening in the distant, like in the near future, but I think uh, having a much simplified taxation regime, much better commerce and trade, um, you know, what are the things that you think are gonna be contributing factor 
and what are the areas of opportunities as you see in your line of business when it comes to economic integration between the countries in this part of the world? Yeah, go ahead. Stand. I think the trade tariffs amongst the countries yeah. is a big obstacle. Uh, you're trying to cross border of products from one country to another, the average is 13 days. Mm. That's a long time. And, uh, and how could that be cut down? Like what causes that well, delay? It, yeah. it, it's all through vision and leadership. Yeah. Those are the, those are the, mm. the biggest obstacles. And, it, and it, everybody looks after his own purse, mm. right? They want to have the fair yeah, But do you think things are getting better areas. in the last few years, or is, are things the same, or are they getting worse? Like, I mean, it, what's it, the general sense? It's initiative? getting better. It's yeah. getting better, but too slow. Too slow. Yeah. And who suffers are the poor people that suffer. Mm. The prices go up. Yeah. So, Yuki, what's your experience in the software industry? Like, I mean, economic integrations and sort of, you know, ability to sort of set up companies in different countries, uh, if, you know, do sale in other countries, the taxation between countries. What's your experience been? coming from your industry uh, on the economic integration? Because I'm sure you do business outside Japan as well, right? I don't have that experience yet. Okay. <laughs> I'm still in Japan. Mostly now. Japan? Yes, yes. And all your and employees I'm, are in Japan? All your customers are in Japan? Or yes, your, and I'm trying to expand to U.S. at the moment okay. um, because home health is, uh, U.S. is the leadership. Yeah and we're trying to do the beta test, so it's not that stage not, yet. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Anyone else wants to offer perspective here? Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the stuff we talk about at ABAC is that there are some really big issues like digital, uh, sorry, like uh, finance. Mm. Uh, so trying to make sure that you can effectively get financial passporting going in the region is really important. And we're working on trying to make sure that that aligns as much as possible with what's happening in the US and Europe so that you don't create something just for Asia, that you have something that's that's global, but also for Asia that speaks to that. The second is digital for all the reasons we've just heard about. A, re a third really big theme is food because a lot of the, well, all of the nations of ASEAN are big food producers and often they are developing. So mm. they develop through uh, the growth of food and logistics around food and infrastructure mm. around food. Mm. But the, the big thing that we found as we've worked through this, not just in, in uh, APEC or ASEAN, but also elsewhere, is if you want economic integration, <clears throat> you've got to do a million things all at once. You can't just say if we solve finance, it's solved. You've got to solve everything. So just an example, something nobody will have noticed in the leaders, the non-leader statement that turned into a chairman statement of APEC leaders last week out of Port Moresby was an agreement amongst leaders on a roadmap around removal of non-tariff measures and non-tariff barriers. Yeah. These are the terrible little things where someone comes up with a bogus food safety law or stops something at the border because of a bogus investment problem or something. Uh, what I call protectionism and drag. Uh, so th the, there's a roadmap now that, that governments have bought into to try and remove and reduce those through, through the APEC member economies. Who thought of that? Well, actually, ABAC New Zealand, the business community mm. thought of that and put it through over, over many years. So it goes to the point about when you want economic integration, yes, focus on big themes, but you really need to have water on a rock. You need to do a lot of things all the time, business dealing with government, making the case because otherwise it'll backslide on you all the time. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great perspective, uh, Phil. Let's just uh, talk a bit more about, you know, the current trend globally, right? I mean, uh, there was a big move towards globalization about a decade back and a two decade back. And a lot of countries prospered, a lot of trade and all that stuff. All those good things happened, right? In the last few years, we have been noticing a bit of a movement against globalism. You see, uh, you know, that's what countries are calling it nationalism which is basically around promoting their own trade industry and sort of, you know, more opportunities for their own people. You see that happen a lot in now in U.S. and also with this whole uh, discussion between Ch U.S. and China, uh, that whole trade barrier going up, and then, of course, uh, British, uh, the Brexit. Now, when it comes to these kind of events, like what could be, uh, you know, what could be that mega thing that could happen in Asian, this part of the world? Uh, do you think the growth of China on one side would cause everyone else in Asia to come together, because incrementally, of course, a lot of good things are happening here and there, but I think I'm looking for like, what could be the prognosis here in terms of the next five, 10 years? Where would things go here? I mean, um, would it be one cohesive building block? Would it be like a set of separate countries doing their own stuff incrementally? Or would there be like a two block thing, which is like China as one big block, and then everyone else as another big block? Because clearly one large, player would cause everyone else to come together as well. 
And how do you think that happened? What would be India's role in that? Because that's another big block emerging. So there are two big countries, China and India, which probably would be world's uh, number, China would probably be number one economy in the world in the next couple of years, and then India would probably be number three economy. Uh, so China, US, India, that's probably gonna be the, the order. That's what people are uh, forecasting. So in that context, I mean, what will happen in terms of, uh, would the countries come together, rest of the countries in Asia? Would they uh, probably stay the same or there's something else would emerge? It's like, more like a white space thinking. I mean, what, what kind of uh, thoughts anyone wants to offer? I mean, Peter, you wanna go? Um, well, as I already mentioned in my opening statement, uh, I think it creates a, a reasonable opportunity for uh, especially this part of Southeast Asia. So it's a, it's a, it's a matter of how is uh, ASEAN going to seize this opportunity? Hmm. Is there a political will? So do you think there is a vision and leadership? I think uh, Torkel talked a lot about, and I think Samuel talked about, this all goes down to having a strong leader yes. who has a vision and then who then emerges and gets support and the mandate and goes about it. Do you think something like that, you see that in the offing, or do you think you are just hoping that something will, like that well, will? As I hope already stated in my, my first remarks, I, uh, I think there is a reasonable opportunity, and mm. I see uh, ASEAN as a framework, mm. but I still uh, see some things lacking in the agenda of ASEAN to commit themselves to this kind of leapfrog development you need. Mm. I spoke about the digital framework, which is still a very, let's say, thin agenda uh, in the way it is now uh, part of the negotiation discussions. And I think if you want mm. to see that there has to be political leadership to, to grasp that in the next few years. Otherwise, uh, you will be de defragmented and it will be individual Asian countries, maybe Singapore, Malaysia, some local bi bilateral type of uh, relationships. And that would def definitely uh, damage the whole concept and the potential of ASEAN. Uh, as we saw in Europe, I mean, it was uh, founded in different times, mm. but we also benefit a lot, especially smaller country like the Netherlands. There's one element I also like to add that it's, the open market is not only about the free flow of goods and materials, but also the free flow of talent. Talent as well, today, yeah. Today, that's a very important one because uh, our industry, our economy only thrives because of we have these migration flows within Europe, uh, which can take place uh, more or less borderless. And we also have the adoption of a large contingent of uh, refugees coming from Syria, coming from other continents in risk. And that is actually the talent is which is driving our economic growth because our local population will not uh, cannot account for that. Yeah, now you make a very good comment because yeah, Europe also has a very uh, you know almost seamless flow of talent between countries, and U.S. by itself is a large country and it's also has traditionally been very open to immigrants and talent. Uh, just a few things happening in the last two years though. Uh, compared to that, Asia has actually been an exporter of talent. You know. Uh, largely, I think uh, that's a very interesting perspective, and I think uh, how could we ensure free flow of talent in the countries? Anyone? Yeah, Phil, you want to go? Yeah. I'll, oh, you you want to go? Talk or want to say something? I'll just jump in. That. Yeah. That what, what's clear? I, I, th I think the China-U.S. rivalry will take some time to play out. Yeah. It's bigger than just Trump, and it's bigger than just Xi. Yeah. So I, I think it, I think it takes a while. Uh, no one wants to take sides. I mean, no one wants to take sides, right? Why would you do that? Uh, and the danger is that, that people are forced to, and those si that side taking will be based on issues not just economic, it'll be based on military issues, it'll be based on cultural issues, it'll be based on historical relationships and so on, friendships, those sorts of things. So how can we, move, how can we kind of move through that mm. as the rest of Asia? Well, it seems to me the best way through is to think about coalitions of the willing. Mm. And there's a, a lot of ways we can think about coalitions of the willing. One is the plurilaterals. We've already seen CPTPP. Hmm. We've seen Japan EU. We're hoping to see uh, Pacific Alliance. We're hoping to see something else happening out of Latin America and so on. We might get other countries joining CPTPP. We may, God willing, get RCEP off the deck. That'll be great to have. Hmm. So that, that's one thing. There'll, there'll be some more work through APEC and there'll be some more work through ASEAN. I think we've got to double down and really focus on those things that draw us together and say to our colleagues in America and China, look, you want to be part of this? Please, come on. And, mm. and you listen to Trump saying maybe he'll join CPTPP. That's an indication that the US business community is saying, are you aware of how much you're missing out on mm. through not being into this regional economic integration architecture? So I think we just got to keep at it ourselves, the smaller countries, the countries that aren't one of those two, make sure we make some of the running. No, oh, very good. Thank you, Phil. Yes, Doc. Yeah. In the terms of uh, integration in the region and the yeah. non-physical integration. I think we've, we've hinted at it, but I think the role of technology hmm. and non-state actors is increasingly important. 
And as Dr. Lowe mentioned about the, the being able to transfer money by credit card or by uh, other by our iPhones, we can transfer money around the world. That's going to have a transformational effect, and it's going to change the way things are financed and the microfinancing ability to reach the classes of people that before were out of touch with the finance, giving them a financial identity that lets them leverage that for their own micro business, but also aggregate and political uh, power and influence, I think is going to be transformational as well. And the temptation, and we see this in parts of India, we, we have it now in the U US, is this demagoguery around populism or around those issues that they know get a rise out of people, but aren't good for the really the national good or the global good. And so the, the real uh, goal, and I think some of that transcending that is the role of that is on these non-state actors that have, uh, that attend these types of events uh, that have influence in their large companies and in their, the decisions they make that can kind of transcend and influence the media as well, uh, if you can separate it from the financial interests of the media. but. The, the, I think there's, there's things happening that are, tr that are really, weren't here 20 years ago, that are really much more powerful now than states just have to facilitate. And don't expect yeah. states to solve. You know, I think, uh, I think the Netherlands and New Zealand are great examples, small countries that will punch above their weight, that do a lot to facilitate good in the greater region. And you know, expecting the United States and China to solve their differences in this big grand scale that will bring some kind of harmonious environment, I think is not gonna happen for a while, as you said. So I think it's, it's really up to these other actors, smaller players in the aggregate. And I think the future can, is really gonna be o okay. And ASEAN yeah. is in a really sweet spot. Yeah. So you're saying, I mean, in general, we are overplaying the role of political systems and political players, right? I mean, uh, the lot more role of the negative impact of demagoguery and Got it. and populism, which is a okay. threat in some countries. Sure. Yeah. So Manish, I just want to sort yeah. of put a counter to your you know, so overview about glo globalization. Mm. Yeah. I, I think there is a bit of, um, I, you know, sort of media beat out about mm. globalization. I think we, we saw the rise of Brexit and, and popularism to, to use a short term word for it. Yeah. It's really globalization has really helped lift the standard of the living globally. I think the, 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 in the 60s or 70s, New Zealand or Australia's cost of clothing is about three times what it is today. Only because China, now Vietnam's are pro providing that sort of low cost clothing. I'm just using one big sure, example. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. That you know, we are talking about the basic economy of theory and supply that you do what you're good at. Mm. You keep your standard of living by producing lots of milk powder in New Zealand, Australia, you produce all minerals and you let the, the Chinese or the Vietnamese produce clothing. I mean that is a fair exchange and that will not cease. I, I think what's happening in, in in the rise of popularism is that the people who suffer from the loss of those low-value jobs, the factory job, the mm. rust belts, mm. they are the ones that have felt very aggrieved by it, and that's why they voted in to, to get rid of, of um, get Britain out of, of you, EU, other people outside mm. London. So I know it's a simplistic view, but it is a, a, a domestic issue where the wealth that has been created by globalization mm. hasn't been distributed Equitably, yeah. So, yeah. so I think in a way. But could something that also happen in Asia in the sense that um, could there be sections of people who may who are losing out as a result of the economic growth and they are seeing other people prosper, and could then there be political leaders who rise by catering to those sections of people who have been losing out? Is that a possibility you see in parts of Asia? Because you know you see about Trump in the U.S., you see about uh, people in in uh, see Modi himself as well has risen up from a very humble background. Um, so there could be those possibilities as well. And I think when these leaders rise up, they will cater to their electorate first, which would which would mean that it may or may not be serving an integration or the global prosperity as a as an objective. Do you, do you see those things happening in any country in Asia, or uh, what's your thoughts on this? Anyone? Stanley or? Yeah. Well, I think the, yeah. 
global governance mm. is coming up very fast because mm. you can see that in Malaysia there was a mm. big rise of the population to get rid of an, a regime that mm. they didn't like. Right? I think people are now getting wiser because they're getting more connected, they're getting more content, mm. they learn about things, there's no longer, um, there's no longer a wall. Yeah. I think at right. least from a technology and a media perspective, there are, I mean, things are just so integrated now That's that anything right. that happens in one country, you get to hear about it like within a second, right, in, in any That's other right. country in the world. And actually I want to add one more yeah. point to talk to those, uh, yeah idea about technology. There is in existence now a network called DAV, D-A-V. Yeah. It's a Distributed Autonomous Vehicle Network. Mm -hmm. They are already preparing this platform to service autonomous vehicles. Yeah. So that's a, that's a foundation in Switzerland. I think they will launch in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. They are already building that up. So the DAV network will be very, very influential in physical integration into digital integration. Hmm. Okay. You, anyone want to offer a comment on the last? Yeah. It, it's, it's with, with regard to many of the leaders in this part of the world, yeah. it's been relatively simple over the last 10 years. You just heard the Deputy Prime Minister of Vietnam there speak about growth, yeah. growth, growth, growth. And, and he talked about businesses being at the centre. And that's a common message, it's a great message, by the way, congratulations to him, thank you. Um, it's a great message, but I'm sure that he and his colleagues will increasingly talk about inclusiveness and sustainability. They'll talk about it in their way though, their, the, social, the social protection system of Vietnam will inevitably be different from the social protection system of the Netherlands. It's for a whole bunch of reasons, yeah. including affordability and so on. But what, 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 what I hope you'll see is more leaders in ASEAN and in Asia more generally start to use that kind of language and then actually start to put policies in place so that we don't have a big lump of people left behind who are basically living on the street. You don't, you don't want that to happen. And that's where things like home care and the role of the private sector is so important because the private sector can actually offer some of those inclusiveness opportunities and some of those inclusiveness ideas much, much faster than government. So as usual, if you want to get this right, Government's got to say and do some things, and then the private sector's got to come to the party as well, which is Torquil's point, a very important point, uh, about, about trying to innovate off the edges of that process. Got it. But I hope you'll see more of that inclusion language from leaders, not, this is not a political statement, yeah. more I mean, of that you're, kind you're of so, idea so, on those economies. So, like, you're so right on track, because many leaders are now talking about harmonious growth. It's not just growth. Harmonious growth or equitable growth as other different words coming out. And I think uh, there's a big realization that, you know, uh, you need to take the big section of society together as well. Um, I wanted to also give a chance to the participants if anyone wants to ask any question because I think a lot of great perspective got shared so in the context of regional integration. If anyone has any question to any of the panelists or they could ask me as well and I'll direct to the right panelist. Anyone wants to ask any question? Looks like either we have done a very good job or we have been talking about things that no one got. So anyway, uh, so uh, let's just move towards the, uh, let's try to wrap this up, right? So, sorry. Yeah, I, Peter, you're talking about. I have a little question. I might go a little bit off tangent, but since we're talking about uh, comparison with Europe and how there's been some countries that have taken a more active leadership role and you're talking about protectionism and everyone's looking out for their own votes at the end of the day and want to keep their own people happy. Is there somebody else other than China or Japan who could probably be a de facto leader or somebody who could sort of bring this agenda and bring everyone together? Because the obvious people that you look to for leadership would be, correct me if I'm wrong again, uh, should there be somebody else? or? What, what are the thoughts? I think that's a good question because see, uh, if you ask my perspective, my, my view would be, uh, because China is on a rising power, so clearly, sorry? Exactly, they're thinking about themselves, so they would probably be just more focused on themselves. So then, for the rest of the, rest of the Asia, I think the big countries that are left are basically India and Japan, I think, if you think about it. And of course, there are many countries there, but in terms of size of the economy and sort of, you know, so I don't know, I mean, could there be someone? I mean, let's just ask, 
Can I, can I yeah. give you a controversial view, yeah. being an a, a yeah. Asian but living in Australia, so I'm an outsider now. Yeah. I don't think you'll find the, the Confucian Asia, there won't be anyone that wants to go and challenge. It's not their style, no, right? Uh, whether it's Vietnam or Hong Kong or Korea or whoever else, it's not their style to take on and have a fight with anybody else. I think it's going to be consensus driven and you will be behind the door. You will not see out open. I think Phil made an earlier, earlier comment about what I call the strategic competition between US and China that no one will take side. I disagree. Everyone wants the US to win because Chinese has grown so much that they are not abiding by the WTO sort of regulation in the debt. So there is, there is a, a, a rebalancing required. And in a way, again, I'm being simplistic here, the Western democratic system that wanted China to grow, that when it grows rich, it become liberal. That wake up to the fact that CCP is not to let that happen. So there is an adjustment going on right now, which I think is good for the future of the world as a whole. So we're gonna have some volatility in the next five years, live with it live with it. And, and then we talk about TPP 11, the rest of the world will get on with it. But we do think that, again, I'm really controversial here, the two superpowers has to sort out what, what will sustain themselves. Nobody else can do it. We, we don't think we should, I, I think it would be foolish of us to think that somehow there is a magic silver bullet that will overcome this. Yeah. And no, we have to work as a group. I think you have a very good comment, Suming. I also don't see any third front emerging at this point in time. If you look, even if you look at the Cold War time, there was a non-aligned movement and other things. There's a third front emerged, right? When people didn't want to align with Soviets or the US. But I think uh, I'm still waiting to see a very credible third front emerging. So I think it would happen that China and US, I think that will continue for some time. And uh, you're right. I mean, it's a very interesting struggle where China is gaining more and more importance and power. And uh, U.S. is sort of, in a way, um, trying to reassess its own priorities because uh, all these years, U.S. Was, uh, was acting more as a world leader and had been funding quite a few things which didn't benefit them immediately. And now they are thinking more in terms of, okay, what's in it for me? And I think they are right, right in doing so in the short term, but I think uh, longer term, I think we'll have to see how this plays out. Uh, what I would love to see is a third power emerging, which I don't see happen at this point in time. Yeah. I know you mentioned to exclude yeah. Japan in this, but uh, just as a comment yeah. here, uh, the Prime Minister Abe is uh, a very interesting person. He's not the person that some of the media makes him appear to be. He's not a he's not a right wing tyrant or something. He's a he's the center of a Venn diagram where everybody wants a piece of him, and whoever gets a piece of him uses him to promote what they're talking about. But in, in terms of strategic vision, he's articulated a really good strategic vision when he says an open, free Indo-Pacific. So of course there's code words in there related to China, but I think it also shows a vision that includes India in the East Asian economic sphere and welcoming us to all think about India as part of this Indo-Pacific region. Open and free means, of course, non-CCP-led. You know, China, as long as they have the CCP, they're not going to be totally free, but other countries are making progress. It's not reverting, but everyone else in ASEAN is making uh, attempts at being more open and free. And I think this articulated vision is a leadership. Japan is sensitive, though, about its history and doesn't want to be out in front and doesn't want to be seen as yeah. leading. But I think quietly it's pushing and using yeah. its economic uh, and technology to l be a leader while the U.S. is on hold for a little while, yeah. uh, aside from the U.S. military, which is very active in the region, as yeah. was mentioned. But you make a very good comment. Between China and Japan, I think the uh, uh, rest of the Asia is getting closer to Japan, I'm noticing, in the last few years. In fact, if you look at India as well, there's a lot more discussions happening between India and Japan, and I think other parts of Asia as well. Uh, yeah. Just to reinforce what Tokel said, now the, the foreign, uh, now the foreign sort of analysts are using the word Indo-Pacific. The other jargon that people are throwing around is the Quad. That means the Quad consists of you know, US, Japan, India, and Australia. 
and the in that on that front, there's a lot more a lot more action on the defense side. They're doing joint exercises together much more. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think it's really important for everybody to understand that countries always act in their own interests. So when the Marshall Plan was first uh, brought out by General Marshall after the end of the Second World War in Europe, what was the interest of the US? Well, it was in making sure the US didn't go to war again and in making sure there was a prosperous Europe for which America would benefit. And they did, of course. So the idea that somehow all of a sudden you've got self-interest dominating. No, no, self-interest always dominated. It's just that the nature of the self-interest is now different. Yeah. The US's self-interest is much more mercantilist. What's in it for me? Yeah. The nature of China is much more aggressive. Uh, 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 Xi is pushing a much more aggressive line. What's the resolution to that? Well, I don't think there's one big political force that's the resolution to that. I think there are two themes. Hmm. One is a theme of lots and lots of people, including people in this room, speaking their mind about what, should, what good looks like, making sure in the private and public sector so much as we can, offering alternative views to that, that rather difficult reality. The second thing is illustrated by a, by a conversation I had with a very good um, a friend of mine at the OECD. I said he's an expert on trade. I said to him, how can we communicate the benefits of trade for all? Hmm. He said, by making trade work for all. In other words, we should not think of this as a communications job. We all need to make sure that we are contributing actually to improving the benefits of yeah. trade, including, for example, for women, for micro, small and medium enterprises, for migrants and for rural communities. Unless we're up for that, then welcome to Trump and welcome to that kind of protectionist sentiment. Yeah. Good. Yes, Peter, go ahead. Um, well, um, just draw the analogy with the Netherlands, which is a relatively small country in Europe. Mm. Although sometimes in policy making, the Netherlands appears to be an influential uh, country in, in the bigger EU. So if you all project that to ASEAN, you can imagine that there are all role model countries, smaller countries like Singapore, who can act as a role model and who have that influence because they are not threatening any size at all. Although many countries, and also Vietnam, is very open to look at the history of the development of countries like Singapore and Taiwan because there are quite some similarities uh, in their agricultural background only like 20 to 30 years ago, and they made that successful transformation. So I fully agree that there is no room for a one uh, leader uh, model which uh, will definitely not uh, absorb, uh, be absorbed in this Confucius type of environment where everybody is looking for that consensus type of approach. Although the people here in Vietnam, but also in Thailand, I uh, experience are quite open to listen and to learn from these neighboring countries and also to take the similarities in their history and how they can adopt. Um, so, and I think there's sometimes small countries in these kind of ASEAN or EU type of constructs can be of uh, influence in that. All right, no good. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about anything else anyone wants to bring up because uh, yeah, you, you wanted to say something. Sorry, uh, yeah. talking about neighbors. So I'm thinking of the example of, uh, of India. So you're speaking about India and how the Belt and Road Initiative is, uh, is being laid out. So I think in a, it's in a way of also buying loyalty in a way. So look at the example of India's neighbors. So you've got Pakistan hmm. and you've got Sri Lanka. And uh, India's held out for a bit. So what happens then? So in a way, you're being forced to choose sides, I guess, in the long run. So if you're talking about in integration, is that really helping or is that, again, worst case scenario leading to probably two blocks hmm. or like you said a third block emerging where yeah. people will be forced to choose sides and maybe some people are just saying best thing to do now is not make a decision let's just wait to see what happens with the uh, US China dispute yeah. maybe some thoughts on that yeah I think uh, my thoughts there would be that see there is historical antipathies between India and China to that respect and I think uh, Clearly, China's initiatives are being seen from that context, right? Having said that, yeah, I mean, uh, to a great extent, there would be either soft alignment to one of these countries or they'll wait. But my view is if they don't see something emerging, the business has to continue and the work has to keep going on. So then countries will start choosing their soft alignments, even if they don't explicitly call out an alignment, they will probably start choosing soft alignments in one of the other countries. If you look at it, India has probably shown more attachment to the US and also on, on this side towards Japan. So in a way, it is choosing to be against the China part of it. And I think people can make out very quickly, but I don't think they will explicitly state anything. 
But I think uh, that is how things will start progressing in Asia, mostly. Yeah. So uh, could, uh, uh, yeah. Can I just add a couple of random yeah. thoughts on Belt and Road? I, I, I think I'm one of those businessmen that don't believe in conspiracy theory. I, I think it's just China, because of the surplus capacity it has in terms of infrastructure building, decide to export that as a way of doing business. Uh, in terms of strategic implications of that, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think you're starting to see pushbacks in the last 12 months. I think you're starting to see the, the outcries about taking on too much debt and, and Sri Lankan, for example, losing one of their ports because they couldn't service a debt. So there's a lot more awareness. I think Tokel talks about the Singapore KL high-speed rail. Mahathir put a stop on it and seemingly it's because he thinks the debt level is too high. So I, I think the Belt and Road, whether it's a success or not, is, is too early to call, and I, I would be cautious about trying to read too much into that. Okay. And the second comment I want to make, I think it's really important for all of us to, to differentiate between China and the Communist Party. Now, I think, I think that's happening in Australia right now. We're trying to push that line because as a migrant country, when we start talking about the Chinese interview, sorry, interference in the politics in Australia, uh, we always try to make sure as a, you know, as a participant in that debate, please, it's Chinese Communist Party, not the Chinese. It's two different things. Mm. No good, I think, um, I think we are coming to an end. I think we only have probably five minutes. So I'll try to now wrap things up. And I think, uh, first of all, thank you everyone for being here and I think uh, coming from different perspective and sharing your point of view. I think a lot of good things got discussed around, you know, not just physical infrastructure, but also the political context in which things are happening. And also I think a lot of great views came in in terms of, you know, how different uh, countries and blocks are getting formed, what kind of things could emerge. And hopefully I think these kind of discussions and debate will then go on to sort of inform people's view and opinion in terms of how things should progress and hopefully will lead to a better, better kind of an outlook for everyone. Um, again, uh, if anyone wants to make any last comment, I'll then call it a end of it, yeah? Thank you everyone for your time and attention. Can you, can you say something? Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah.